Miss Kelly rose to fame in the late 90s with the R&B pop group Destiny's Child before embarking on her own solo career and throughout her many successes she faced a multitude of battles but fought each one with grace and dignity and today is a shining light that radiates because of it. This is the triumph of Kelly Rowland. Born Calendria Trené Rowland on February 11, 1981 in Atlanta, Georgia, her early years were far from great. Her father Christopher developed PTSD from his time in the Vietnam War and turned to alcohol as a means to escape, but he became violent with her mother, Doris, who would end up leaving her father, cutting off all contact with him and eventually moving to Houston, Texas, taking her daughter with her. Doris was working as a nanny, but the pair struggled and were constantly moving around and living with different families who took them in. Calendria, who went by Kelly for short, found comfort in gospel music, particularly the Clark sisters, and began singing in the children's choir at church and got pretty good. It became a means of escape from her reality. She would attend Briar Grove Elementary in Houston, where she would become friends with a young starlet named Latavia Robertson, who was a spokesgirl for Proline's Just For Me campaign, appearing on several hair care products and on the TV commercials singing the jingle. She also happened to be part of a new girl group called Girls Time as a rapper, with her two cousins who were dancers and her two friends who were the lead singers, one of them being a young Beyonce Knowles. And after hearing Kelly sing, Latavia was blown away with her vocal talents. Kelly and I were friends, and we used to play Barbies in the, in the closet. And she was singing Whatever You Want From Me from Whitney Houston. And I heard her um, sing, and I was like, um, I think that you need to come and <laughs> audition from the group that I'm in. A lot of people don't really think, hmm, this person has an amazing voice. Let me bring them into my situation. No, Kelly, her voice is amazing. It's angelic. Like, <laughs> it really is. Kelly would audition and fulfill the final spot in the group, which was managed by Andretta Tillman and Brian Moore. Because she was new. She was the new girl on the block. And she, they didn't know anything about her, and so they didn't want to allow her to sing. But something about Kelly just intrigued me. Her face, there was something about her presence that said, this girl's a star. And then I said, oh God, please let this girl be able to sing. And she opened her mouth and she could sing, but her voice was so tiny. It was so tiny that I had to almost sit inside her mouth to hear it. But I could hear that diamond. In many published stories by her vocal coach, David, her manager, Brian, and group member Latavia, Kelly was described as having wonderful singing talents, but also lacking confidence, which was likely brought on by years of negative experiences, as her mother was said to be very strict and oftentimes disciplined her in front of everyone. This led to many of the members kind of walking all over her, as she was also shy and timid. For a while, she and her mom would begin living with Latavia's close relatives before her mom decided to move back to Atlanta. But Andretta, who went by Miss Anne, pleaded with Doris to allow Kelly to stay in Houston and live with her as the group's dreams were materializing and Doris obliged. Miss Anne looked after and protected Kelly as if she were her own daughter. The group would go on to do several live performances and showcasings and had their first major appearance on Star Search in late 1992 but lost to a rock band which dealt the group a devastating blow and one of the group's lead singers would abruptly quit the group following this. Down but not out, the group snagged a deal with Daryl Simmons' production company called Silent Partner Productions in early 93. But they would make a few more changes to the group, who by now had added new member Latoya Luckett to the lineup. According to Brian, Daryl and his partner, Sylvia Roan, felt there was no need for dancers in the group, so Latavia's cousins were axed, and they also sought to replace Latavia herself as they didn't want a rapper either. But after their vocal coach, David, vouched to turn Latavia into a singer, the company's management team then sought to remove Kelly from the equation, saying she was too stiff and hadn't matured vocally. Also, there were notions that they didn't want more than one dark-skinned girl in the group, instead opting to place a young Kiki Wyatt in Kelly's spot. However, Anne fought hard for Kelly, as she was her baby, saying there will be dark-skinned girls in this group, and if there's no Kelly, there's no deal. Ultimately, the group would press on as a foursome and went through several name and production deal changes as the group progressed over the next four years. But Anne had a long battle with lupus, and as her condition worsened, she could no longer take care of Kelly. 
Beyonce's father, Matthew Knowles, by this point had made his way onto the management team, albeit by force after threatening to remove his daughter if he wasn't offered a spot. He would take Kelly in to live with his family and obtain legal guardianship of her. He tried to do the same for Latoya and Latavia, but their mothers refused. He would set up boot camp style rehearsals at his house, and as the group grew artistically, the critiques Kelly would receive from Matthew were blunt, and as she was already very sensitive, a few people in the camp said that she would often cry when he badgered her. But when she bounced back, she would always bounce back stronger and better each time. Eventually, the group would sign with Columbia Records, and following Anne's death in 1997, Matthew Knowles would take over as the group's full-time manager, and all members would fall under his Music World Productions deal. The group would go on to release the singles No 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 Part 1 and 2 and With Me, along with their self-titled debut album, and Kelly would don a brand new look and cement herself as the second lead vocalist of the group with newfound confidence and the will to get out there and show the world her talents. For the first two platinum selling albums, Kelly had lead vocals on many songs like Illusion, Show Me The Way, Now That She's Gone, and Get On The Bus, just to name a few, along with hits like Bills Bills Bills, where she sang the pre-chorus, and the bridge on Bugaboo, although she later said that it was her least favorite part of any Destiny's Child song. But when the group paired with gospel label mates Mary Mary on the song God's Been Good To Me, Kelly would sing lead vocals on behalf of the group taking the time out to thank God for just how far they came at that point. The group would make several appearances in music videos for a wide range of artists and in TV shows, and it became apparent that aside from her singing talents, her beauty, which was like that of a runway model, also made her stand out as a fan favorite, especially amongst the guys who had no problem shooting their shot. Let me get this. I'm trying to tell you, Mickey Kelly got some serious business. You bloomers, huh? Bloomer. Oh. <laughs> All no, the little innocent. Hey, innocent. Us thing. little personal. Can we chat? Oh, well, no. Oh, well, game. Hey, I don't know. You be the judge. <laughs> but I would have hollered at her if I was Kelly. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, y
In the end, LaToya and LaTavia would be replaced by Michelle Williams and Farrah Franklin, but Farrah would quit just months later as she couldn't handle Matthew's terror. Lawsuits would ablaze between the parties, and public bashing in the media would ensue. Ironically, throughout the entire ordeal, the original group members only saw each other one time in person, when they bumped into each other while shopping, which just so happened to be on Kelly's birthday. And I'll let them tell you how the conversation went. I saw Latavia in the mall one day, but I mean, let's cut that over. Don't say her name. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Latoya and I, we never quit the group. Never quit. We never quit. Never left. Never even said anything about, about quitting. quitting. There was two over here and two over here. A group can't work like that at all. Losing my identity and I was not being treated as you would personally want someone treating your daughter if the tables were switched around and um, I just couldn't, you know, handle the situation anymore. Farrah um, just decided it was all too much for her. The schedule was all too much. You're doing things that you wouldn't do normally, and you're, you know, you're not who you are, and there's such a thing as selling your soul for fame. All of the bad seeds are now out of Destiny's Child. That's We've right. had changes in the group, and we finally found <coughs> the recipe that is perfect. Even amidst the bad press, Kelly maintained her loyalty to the Knowles family whenever she was asked about it. And in turn, Beyonce showed her loyalty to Kelly. It's just so crazy how the media can just be so cruel at times. Matthew's like my father. How are you gonna call my father a liar or a person that's stealing from somebody or not even know the story period and twist it? That is very sick to me. Beyonce, that's my sister. You've never met this person, yet still you wanna print all these horrible, vicious things about her and not know what a beautiful person she is. And I could have very well gone solo, right? but because of my loyalty to the fans and because of my love for Kelly, that's something that I don't wanna do and I wasn't ready to do. And we still had a hit album to do. <clears throat> Amen, 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 After the new trio's successful 2001 Survivor and Eight Days of Christmas albums and endless awards, accolades, and appearances, the group would roll out each member releasing a solo album for 2002. Michelle had dropped her gospel album in the spring and Beyonce was set to drop her debut in the fall. Kelly's was due in 2003. Now up to this point, Kelly wasn't really known for anything outside the group. She had snagged a recurring role on the UPN sitcom The Hughleys as Carly Hughley an inspiring singer tasked with coming up with new music. And lo and behold, the music she sings on the show were Destiny's Child hits. So even when she branched out, everything tied back to the DC brand. But when the rapper Nelly was gearing up to release his album Nellyville in the early summer of 2002, he sought to get a female artist for the last song he was working on called Dilemma. His sister was battling leukemia at the time, and he asked her just who she wanted to sing on the song, and she chose Destiny's Child telling her brother, hey, if you can't get the whole group, see if you can get Kelly to do it, cause she's my favorite. And in the end, Nelly and Kelly would record and finish the song just three days before the album was to be printed. This duet became one for the ages, and it would catapult Kelly to heights that none of the members had seen outside the group. Upon its release, it shot straight to number one on the Billboard Hot 100 and stayed there for 10 weeks. It reached the top 10 in every country it charted in. Yeah, let that marinate. It would be certified triple platinum and would garner Kelly and Nelly a Grammy Award for Best Rap Sung Performance at the 45th Annual Grammy Awards, making her the first Destiny's Child member to achieve this feat on their own. The video was equally as popular and showcased the pair having a love for one another while being in relationships with other people, thus creating the dilemma. The song samples Patti LaBelle's song, Love, Need, and Want You so it was only appropriate that she appeared in the hits music video as Kelly's mother. Patty later stated, I was so happy to hear them use my song. I jumped for joy. It's 26 years old, so I recorded that song before either of them were born. And Kelly is such a sweet person that I would welcome her into my heart and my home. Actually, if ever I had a daughter, I would envision Kelly. They would perform the song live at several events, including a Patti LaBelle tribute concert years later. 
But in the meantime, Matthew and Music World will rush to capitalize off the song's success, pushing back Beyonce's debut to the following year and rushing to get Kelly in the studio to record her debut album, which consisted of an eclectic blend of R&B and rock, as Kelly wanted to incorporate her love for alternative music into the project. However, it was crunch time, as she only had three weeks to complete it, and at times she felt pressured by the high expectations due to the success of Dilemma and the notions of being a Destiny's Child member. She said it was a challenge and there were days in the studio where I would run out like I'm frustrated, I don't want to do this. But my family and Destiny's Child would call me and tell me everything's going to be okay. I got through it because of them. But because of the rush, much of this album was selected out of Sony Music's song pool of demo tapes. Basically, Kelly went through different songs and just picked which one she liked best. Therefore, this album had a slew of songwriting credits from artists like Brandy, Andre 3000, Joe Budden, and Carrie Hilson, with a few songs being written by Solange, Matthew, and Kelly herself. And we're on the set of my video, Stone. Has been granted. Come on in. The album's first single was Stole, which was a pop rock song that delves into heavy topics plaguing the teenage community, including pregnancy, depression, substance abuse, and violence. While many critics felt it was an odd choice for a first single, others felt it showcased Kelly's versatility as an artist not bound by any one genre. The song was a moderate hit in the US but was much bigger overseas, going platinum in Australia, reaching the top five in Denmark. Belgium, New Zealand, Scotland, and Norway. The song was a universal fan favorite, as just about every young person could relate to it. The album, Simply Deep, was released on October 22, 2002, and eventually went gold in the States and platinum overseas. Though critics had a field day with the album, calling it too diverse, criticizing many of the rock-infused music for interfering with the overall cohesiveness of the album, and of course they compared Kelly's efforts to Beyonce and the work of Destiny's Child. But the fans, of course, appreciated the body of work. Even if it felt like you were listening to a mixed CD, you couldn't say that any of the songs were bad, as Kelly's smooth melodic vocals fit perfectly with every sound on every beat. Like on the pop rock jam, Love Lives in Strange Places, and on the jazzy joint, Heaven. Other singles from the album included Can't Nobody, which was produced by Rich Harrison. And while it was compared to his work on A. Marie's recent album, the instrumentation on the song would lay the ground for future Rich Harrison productions, like on Tony Braxton's Take This Ring and on 3LW's Do Ya. The song was an album highlight and a great single choice, but saw little promotion in the States. And the last single, Train on a Track, was described as a lovely guitar-driven love song with lush harmonies and acoustic guitars with poetic wordplay. Though the romantic single found its way onto the Made in Manhattan soundtrack, it met the same fate as the previous singles, only faring well overseas. And with this, Kelly would embark on the Simply Deeper tour which took place in Europe, and opening acts included Solange and an up-and-coming Estelle. This was Kelly's first tour venture on her own, but it was very therapeutic as her confidence continued to rise along with her love for performing. She had come so far, and this was only the beginning. She would collaborate with French rapper Stommy Bugsy on his single, Une Femme en Prism, and would make her official big screen debut in the film Freddy vs. Jason. Freddy! How sweet. Dark meat. No! Let's go now! <laughs> Walking in a winter wonderland, I said. Walking in a winter wonderland. Walking in a winter wonderland. the next song, how about All Holy Night? How about enough singing? After appearing on TV shows like Eve and American Dream, she would secure her first leading lady role in The Seat Filler, a romantic comedy musical in which she plays a celebrity named Janelle, in which she showcased both her acting talents and singing chops. The film was written by and stars Dwayne Martin, Shamar Moore, and Spice Girls member Melanie B. 
Following this, Destiny's Child would regroup for one final album, Destiny Fulfilled, in late 2004, and it marked yet another successful era for the group. Among their many hits, the song Girl was an ode to Kelly from Beyonce and Michelle, pleading her to leave a toxic relationship that she had been dealing with at the time. Though many fans thought it was endearing, similar to previous songs like Once a Fool, where Beyonce warns Kelly of a shady love interest, no one could have expected what Kelly was actually dealing with at that time. You see, after bearing witness to domineering male figures growing up, Kelly would develop an attraction to bad boys. As crazy as it sounds, there is a security in letting a toxic, overbearing, and somewhat menacing partner in to take full control over you in a relationship. If you're used to being around it, you not only know how to adapt to it, but you tend to attract it. And around the time of Simply Deep, Kelly had entered an abusive relationship. And during her time away, Kelly became emotionally estranged from close friends and family as the man took advantage of her vulnerability and made her feel isolated as part of the abuse. She would open up to the world about that relationship a decade later, and it was alleged that the man in question was Nelly's former manager, Kuda Love. But in the meantime, getting away from the toxicity and back in the presence of her girls is what she needed and helped her to move on and into the hands of Dallas Cowboy safety Roy Williams, who she would become engaged to. But during their premarital counseling, Roy came to the realization that he wasn't ready to make the lifelong commitment to her, and they called off their engagement. This came after the announcement of their wedding date to the press, and after Kelly graced the cover of Modern Bride magazine, which hit newsstands after the pair broke up. Kelly was devastated. She said, man, our timing couldn't have been worse. That issue had just came out. I was so embarrassed. For weeks I would walk past the newsstand at the speed of light with my hat pulled down. I didn't want anyone to see me or ask a question, and if they did, I responded with, it's postponed. Kelly would go on to appear on Trina's smash hit, Here We Go Again, and had recurring appearances on the sixth season of Girlfriends, before taking her life experiences to pen and writing new material for her sophomore album, initially titled My Story. But the album would face multiple delays and changes in sound and production after much of the original concepts were shelved. In the midst of all the changes, Songwriter and producer JQ and his team wrote a hit for Kelly called Like a Boy, but somehow it got lost in the shuffle with politics and instead went to her peer and close friend Sierra, who dominated the charts with it. Like fast forward a long time, I end up in session with Kelly Rowland maybe a year or so later um, in Atlanta and we're in session and she's like, JQ, what I really want is a record like that Like a Boy oh, song. And I was like, <laughs> stop and she was like what I was like Kelly stop and she was like I'm being serious JQ I was like we wrote like a boy for you she was like why didn't you let me hear it now the a &R that we sent it to happened to be in the room mm. and we're like we sent it to him oh yeah yeah love that and it's the it's the only time I've seen fire in Kelly's eyes because Kelly is actually the sweetest oh, person sure. in the music for sure. business. Yes. And Kelly turned and looked at him and said, you don't make another decision about a record without me. Kelly at this point was still trying to find her sound as a solo artist and was settled on a more urban approach with this album, now titled Miss Kelly, which featured producers like Rodney Jerkins, Rock Wilder, and Robin Thicke, among many others. The first single was a song called Gots To Go featuring DeBrad, but a last minute addition to the album would be a smash hit called Like This featuring Eve, which would become the new lead single and thrust Kelly back into the limelight, reaching number one on the dance chart, going gold in the States and being certified silver in the UK. The album itself would debut on June 20th, 2007 and displayed a nice body of work that delved into more personal topics with songs like Still In Love With My Ex, Being About Her Engagement To Roy, and Better Without You being about her needing to move on. There was much promotion for this album, including meet and greets, giveaways, and a 12-city tour with Mario as her opening act. She would also perform her hit with Eve at the 2007 BET Awards. However, Kelly's sensitivity greatly affected her moves throughout this era. Even though she was proud of her work and the album's first week sales were high, they quickly dropped as she received lukewarm responses online from her fan base this time around. She wanted to drop work as a single, but after some negative feedback, she felt bad and wasn't so sure of its hit potential. 
She would instead drop Ghetto, featuring Snoop Dogg as the second single in the States. And while her falsetto was nice, the song failed to chart and it was a commercial flop. When asked by a fan site moderator who chose that single, she said, it was my choice, I was in the zone. But it was apparent that she had come to regret this decision. In the end, the song Work would get a Freemasons remix and was released overseas where it went on to become the third highest charting solo single of her career, reaching the top 10 in Australia, Finland, France, Greece, Italy, Switzerland, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. This prompted her management team to go back to the drawing board as she had dance hit potential. She just needed the right kind of music. She said the sales weren't as good as I wanted them to be, and to be honest, I did feel sad about that for a little while. Many fans said that the songs would rock if they were more upbeat. So in 2008, she would present Miss Kelly Diva Deluxe that had omitted much of the soppy post-breakup vibe the original album had and replaced it with more vibrant, upbeat sounds and a new single featuring Travi McCoy of Gym Class Heroes. But the release would only happen overseas. The US would get a 7-track EP and it was only available on digital download, but BET would release a Kelly Rowland DVD containing footage of the recording process, live performances, and five of her music videos, including one for Bad Habit, which was a song that she had recorded for Destiny's Child's last album. I never knew a video existed for it. Now even though her re-releases generated some new sales, much of the era's momentum had already passed. Meanwhile, Kelly would team up with MTV Diary for the 10th anniversary of their AIDS awareness campaign called MTV Staying Alive. In the TV special for the Diary of Kelly Rowland, she would set out to various countries in Africa to meet young people who were affected by AIDS and those trying to educate the people about the risks. The special premiered on December 1st, 2008, which is World AIDS Day. And while she received much love and adoration for her charity, Kelly felt it was time for a change in her artistry. Ready to spread her wings, she would fire Matthew Knowles as her manager and part ways with Music World altogether, stating that Matthew Knowles has been a positive influence in my career. I have had great success under his guidance, both as a member of Destiny's Child and with my solo projects. Although we have decided to part ways professionally, the Knowles family and the entire Music World Entertainment team will always be my family. Matthew himself stated that the decision was amicable and that he wished the best for Kelly's future endeavors. For the first time, Kelly was ready to spread her wings and soar on her own. Unfortunately, this decision would come at a heavy price, as Columbia Records dropped Kelly just a month later, as they felt she was no longer commercially viable. And in her words, they basically called her worthless, mostly due to low sales from her second album and doubts that she'd ever duplicate the success of her first. Apparently, for all his shortcomings with her musical decisions, Matthew had been the only force promoting her at that label. So who is she without Matthew and Music World? One thing's for certain though, for much of her solo career at this point, she was wholeheartedly embraced overseas far more than in her own country. So in 2009, she would go where she was wanted, traveling across the globe and spending the next few years living abroad and exploring new sounds musically. She collaborated with French singer Nadia on her single, no Future in the Past, and with Italian singer Tiziano Ferro on the single Breathe Gentle, which went platinum in Italy, but it would be a chance encounter with an up-and-coming DJ, David Guetta, that would change the music trajectory for them both. They met the year prior while she was visiting France and attending one of David's DJ shows, and he began playing the instrumental version of When Love Takes Over, which was a new song he was working on, but when Kelly heard it, it brought tears to her eyes. She said, I felt so much emotion from the track. It was so beautiful. And I remember thinking, why is this touching me like this? As if there was kind of a soul tie to it. Immediately, she asked him for the song so she could write lyrics for it, and he obliged. After she and writing duo Nervo wrote the song in London, she recorded her vocals and presented it to Columbia Records at the time, and they rejected it. Consequently, When Love Takes Over was shelved until David Guetta rediscovered it while finishing his studio album, One Love. The finished song with Kelly's vocals and David's productions was premiered in March of 2009 at the Ultra Music Festival in Miami and was released in Europe a month later. And when I tell you, it blew up almost instantly, reaching the top 10 in over 50 countries and being certified platinum in nine countries. It was among the first of its kind in a booming era of electronic dance music that was dominating the charts going into 2010. The pair performed the song at many spots 
and at a few award shows, and the song's extended version would win a Grammy for Best Non-Classical Remix Recording at the 2010 Grammy Awards. But the accolades didn't stop there. In 2013, Billboard named When Love Takes Over the number one dance pop collaboration of all time, noting its lasting cultural impact that the collaboration would have on dance music and the emerging electronic dance music trend in America at the time of its release. The success of the single would jumpstart a series of major hits for David Guetta, who would go on to become one of the most prolific DJs in music history. And Kelly Rowland is sitting close to me. And Kelly, I never had the chance, but I want to thank you, because you should know the first time a celebrity artist came and gave me trust, it was her, so thank you. For Kelly, it would spark a renewed interest in the dance pop market. Upon her return to the States, she would sign with Universal Motown and release a slew of dance pop hits for the overseas market, like Commander, Rose Colored Glasses, and Forever in a Day, which I recently discovered and is in heavy rotation on my playlist. But one thing that kept coming up for Kelly was that her pop hits weren't hitting back in the States like how current pop divas like Beyonce, Rihanna, and Lady Gaga's were hitting. This led to speculation as to whether or not colorism had anything to do with the US markets not wanting to promote Kelly's image on pop hits, as this wasn't an issue elsewhere. But in the States, people were so fixated on Kelly's complexion, and while no one on planet Earth could deny her beauty, it was always considered to be the dark-skinned exception, especially when compared to her lighter-skinned industry peers and collaborators. Either way it went, the concept for her upcoming third album, titled Here I Am, would see a dance pop theme for international editions and an urban pop slash R&B theme for US editions, with the accompanying singles being released only in their respective territories. For a full breakdown on her international ventures, I recommend you guys check out Black Femininity TV's video on Kelly's pop era, Abroad. It is the most in-depth look into her career and musical experience during that time. But back in the States, she would hit the ground running with singles like Lay It On Me featuring Big Sean, ICE, and Motivation, both featuring Lil Wayne, and the latter marking a triumphant return to the forefront in the States, being her most successful single as a lead artist, being certified double platinum, and winning Song of the Year at the Soul Train Awards. That song was everybody's favorite. The album itself debuted at number one on the US Top R&B Hip Hop Albums chart, making it her highest debut as a solo artist. Another R&B single she did was called Keep It Between Us, which I can only describe as beautiful. Everything about that song was beautiful, even down to the video. She was enjoying the musical success as well as in the world of reality TV. She would host the first season of Bravo's reality competition series, The Fashion Show, before returning to the UK to be a judge on The X Factor UK. And she had such a blast coaching contestants and seeing their development that she would later join X Factor in the US for which she was critically acclaimed. Audiences loved them some Kelly, and she would be awarded Ultimate TV Personality at the 2011 Cosmopolitan Ultimate Women of the Year Awards and TV Personality of the Year at the 2012 Glamour Women of the Year's Awards. This would lead to Kelly coming to Australia to co-host the short-lived dance competition Everybody Dance Now with Jason Derulo, and to later become a coach on The Voice Australia for four seasons. Between 2011 and 2013, she would be featured in TV shows like Single Ladies and Real Husbands of Hollywood. She appeared in the movie Think Like a Man and became the go-to girl for guest features on hit songs like Sean Paul's How Deep Is Your Love, Future's Never End remix, and Fantasia's Without Me featuring Missy Elliott among many other songs. She would then drop her last studio album to date called Talk A Good Game which was released on Republic Records after Universal Motown folded. The lead single, produced by Mike Will Made It, was called Kisses Down Low, and it was a bedroom banger that went gold, exceeding over 500,000 copies sold. Though its sensual nature did stunt its growth as some stations refused to play it, the song could have easily went number one. I don't care what nobody says. But the second and final single was the song Dirty Laundry, in which she finally aired to the world the abuse she suffered in her past relationship and expressed feeling like her success was in the shadow of Beyonce's, a stigma she could never really shake. 
And naturally, social media would use this to paint a narrative that she was jealous in some way, which couldn't be further from the truth. But both Beyonce and Michelle would make appearances on the song You've Changed, which also appears on this album. Other standout tracks include Stand In Front Of Me, which was like Kisses Down Low but in reverse, and the bonus track called Feet To The Fire featuring Pharrell Williams, which was among the best songs in her entire catalog. To promote this album, Kelly embarked on the Lights Out tour, co-headlining with The Dream. This album became her third top 10 album, debuting at number 4 on the Billboard 200 and being nominated for World's Best Album at the 2014 World Music Awards. By now, things were looking up in Kelly's love life. A childhood friend of Michelle's named Tim Weatherspoon had known Kelly for some years and became her manager back in 2011. The two entertained the idea of romance, but Kelly initially didn't take it too seriously because Tim wasn't a bad boy. He wasn't anything like the guys that she had dated in the past. He was your typical guy next door, a brother of sorts to her bandmate, and he was much shorter than the men she was used to. But he truly loved her, and she was able to be vulnerable around him and not live to regret it. They eventually became engaged and would marry on May 9th, 2014. Oh yeah, short kings, we up. And the married couple gave birth to Kelly's twin son, Titan, <laughs> on November 4th, 2014. It was a joyful time indeed, up until her mother's sudden passing just a month later. Kelly and her mother, Doris, had a loving yet complicated relationship. Though she knew her mother did the best with what she could give, it wasn't the most ideal dynamic. In fact, Beyonce's mother, Tina, was the one who walked Kelly down the aisle at her own wedding. Kelly attempted to make peace with her mother's memory. She wanted to write and record an ode to her mother to be released to the fans, which she knew would be freeing, but also said it was going to be the hardest thing she would ever have to do and to this day, it's unknown if she was ever able to do it. She would, however, go on to find forgiveness with her father and rekindle their relationship after almost 30 years of no contact. I lost my mother three weeks after Titan was born. So at that time, I think I still had these feelings of like, oh my God, I have no parents. And it was like, no, you do, you have one left. It was very, very, it was kind of, it was, it was sad, really, to hear the other side of the story. Mm -hmm. Because uh, some of the things that were said, it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that other people said, it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get a chance to see her. And I told a couple of people that what happened, but they really actually didn't believe it. So I wanted to tell Kelly. I wanted to tell Kelly that I loved her and I never have gave her up. And even when they left, when they left Atlanta, I didn't even know that they left Atlanta. Right. I didn't hear Kelly left Atlanta until about, I would say about three or four years. What was it like hearing your dad say to the grown Kelly, I love you? It was, um, it was necessary. Hmm. It was necessary to the little girl in me that needed to hear that. It was necessary to hear it from a man. It, it was necessary to hear it from my father. Mm -hmm. And when I thought about all the tumultuous relationships and trying to figure out men, like that is the base and the foundation of it psychologically. So when mm -hmm. I'm talking to therapists and I'm asking them about this and it, it all runs back mm -hmm. to the abandonment issue. Mm -hmm. And people like make jokes of that sometimes. It's like, oh, well, she has abandoned. No, I, I actually had an abandonment issue. I'm glad she got to mend things with her father as life is short, and she came to the realization that family is of utmost importance. It's worth noting that she also has an older brother named Orlando, who she briefly mentioned on the song Never End, but not much is known about him or his whereabouts, as many other details of Kelly's life and family remain private. Now, once she returned to acting, this time as a new parent herself, Kelly appeared on several episodes of the hit TV show Empire as Lucius Lyon's loving mother, Leah, who suffers a mental disorder, becoming erratic at times and often drowning her son in the bathtub while singing in an attempt to wash away the demon she believed he had. Kelly would also appear on Being Mary Jane and starred in the film Love by the Tenth Date with Megan Good and Carrie Hilson, showing off more of her acting chops. She then paired up with Trevor Jackson on the music video called Dumb in which she showcased some of her best dancing since her days in Destiny's Child. 
They killed that choreography by Frank Gadsden. You couldn't tell them nothing. But wanting to give back to the next wave of talent coming in, Kelly and Frank would direct and lead a reality docuseries called Chasing Destiny in hopes of finding the next superstar girl group. They held auditions and narrowed a list of 600 women down to 15. And over the weeks, through rehearsals and performances, the final five women would emerge as the group June's Diary and were managed by Kelly for a short time. The entire process was featured on BET and inspired Kelly to do more with empowering young women and girls. She would partner up with Dove for their My Hair My Crown campaign, which came after many other beauty companies told her she was too dark to be the face of their campaigns. She knew what it felt like to be ostracized and made to feel bad for different reasons, and hair discrimination was another big one on the list. The song My Crown and its accompanying music video would appear on YouTube and showcase girls of all backgrounds sharing their hair stories and the jingle reinforced that all hair is beautiful and you should wear yours with pride regardless. However, many online spectators weren't thrilled to see Kelly including non-black girls in the visuals and the majority of comments had voiced their disdain in the fact that because white people's hair struggles aren't the same as black people's hair struggles that this somehow meant that white people don't go through no kind of hair struggles and that they should not have been part of the hair conversation. But Kelly's intentions were so that no one felt left out. So it was very disheartening to be drugged up and down the comment sections for being one of the only inclusive people on the planet. Kelly, however, would redeem herself with the smooth, sensual visual, Coffee, which featured a mostly dark-skinned, all-female ensemble that would go down as one of the most aesthetically pleasing visuals in recent years. And though the song is short, there is a 35-minute making of the video for the fans to enjoy. Along with two EPs, the Kelly Rowland edition in 2019 and an EP simply titled K in 2021. And by that time, while fans were giving out their two cents on this new music, a fan page posted a throwback of my favorite Kelly Rowland song, Red Wine. I would state how I felt that the song didn't get its just dues, and Kelly herself replied to my comment. She would gather my behind and remind me that it's about the quality of the music and not about the quantity of those who choose to love it. As long as we love it, that's all that matters. You see, by this time, Kelly was done letting people affect how she felt about her creations, period. She was proud of her work, and that was enough. That same year, she and her husband welcomed their second child, Noah, and she completed the third installment of her Lifetime Christmas movie series called Merry Little Christmas, which us holiday fanatics love to watch every year, and with a fourth installment in the works as of the making of this video. And the film roles kept coming, with Bad Hair, The Curse of Bridge Hollow, and Fantasy Football in 2022. In early 2023, she became a recurring character on the show Grownish. And in late November, five out of the six total Destiny's Child members would reunite and make appearances in Beyonce's Renaissance film, bringing the story almost full circle. Hopefully this is grounds for a full reunion, as we fans want to see it. We also need to see Kelly portray Donna Summer in a biopic. Man, it's been long overdue, man. She already played Gladys Knight in American Soul, which earned her an NAACP Image Award, mind you. In all, Kelly's story is one for the books, and it's still being written. Still, she came, she sang, she achieved with love and grace, and has a beautiful family. Miss Kelly, even if they don't want to give your credits to you, it wouldn't be a Destiny's Child if it wasn't for you. Keep doing your thing, even though you already won. This is Justified by Jury. Y'all know how to hit that like, and y'all know how to hit that subscribe. If you want to, do so. And I will catch y'all in the next video.